uh, plan for your review, task force meeting number eight. Um, first on the agenda, items one and two, uh, the agenda overview and approval of meeting synopsis. So good evening, everyone. On the agenda, we have first the approval of the August task force meeting synopsis. Then we'll move on to a quick overview of the meeting procedures. Then on to the presentation on vehicles miles travel policies by the city's Department of Transportation. And finally, public comment and task force discussion and recommendation. After the meeting is adjourned for public attendees, there will be a virtual meeting survey that pops up in your browser and it will be great if you could provide us feedback on our virtual meeting format. And with that, I'll pass it on to Teresa for the approval of the meeting synopsis. Thank you, Kiwan. Okay, do we have a motion to approve the meeting synopsis from August 20th? Move. So moved. And please say your name and when you make a motion. Pam Foley, council member. Thank you. Seconded by Linda. Thank you, Linda. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Great, thank you. So after the last meeting, you know, it got a little complicated with um, various motions and, and it, you know, it looked like we were, it felt a bit like we were making the sausage as we were uh, going along. So I asked staff to help us all remember, given that we started this process over a year ago, <laughs> what the uh, meeting procedures that this task force falls under. So uh, I'll turn it over to Kulan for that presentation. Thanks, Teresa. So uh, as Teresa mentioned, um, this uh, presentation on the meeting procedures um, came from questions and comments from task force members, as well as the public from the last task force meeting. So the general plan for year review task force is an advisory body to staff. Through the task force meetings, staff incorporates the task force recommendations on the four year review scope of work into the staff report package for city council consideration and approval. The task force meetings follow the Rosenberg's rules of order, a simplified version of Robert's rules of order. The meeting procedures include the following, establishing a quorum where more than half the majority of task force members are present. Uh, at this point, it is 21 members. The agenda, to let everyone know what is being discussed and the order of items at the meeting and the chair or co-chair who conducts the meeting. The chair would ask task force members for input or clarifications, invite public comment, invite motions, seconds, and discussions. And please know that up to three motions can be on the floor. There are three types of motions. The basic motion is the one that puts forth a discussion for the task force consideration. A motion to amend seeks to retain the basic motion. If the maker, the person, and the person who second the motion accepts the friendly amendment, that now becomes the pending motion on the floor. The third is a substitute motion that seeks to throw out the basic motion on the floor and substitute or replace with a new motion. The final decision is with the chair of whether the motion is an amendment or a substitution. Up to three motions can be on the floor and the last motion on the floor is the first to be voted on. So we have an example scenario uh, where there's three motions on the floor. The first is a basic motion. The second motion is an amendment. And the last motion is a substitution. Now with the substituted motion on the floor first, if it passes, then no vote is made on the other motions. If it fails, then the second motion, the amendment to the basic motion is on the floor. Most motions require a simple majority to pass. An example of needing a two-third majority is a motion to limit or stop the discussion. This is also known as to call the question. And that concludes staff presentation on meeting procedures. And I'll pass it back to our co-chair, Teresa, for any comments. Thank you very much, staff. I just wanted to, you know, encourage us to continue in the vein of having consensus conversation. I certainly hope we don't need to uh, fall back on the, on the rules, but I do have them printed out. So uh, if, if, we, if it gets to that and we have three motions on the floor, uh, I, I have that with me, but hopefully- uh, we Madam will... Chair, can I ask a clarifying question? Can I finish my comment? My yes, please. sentence? Um, I, but again, I just, I just hope that uh, that isn't necessary. Yes. Okay, uh, if you have a 
an amend an amendment to a motion and that gets approved, um, then the, you end up with two motions on the floor again, and you can come and then a substitute motion. Do you have a motion? And then a substitute motion comes on. Can you do an amendment to the first motion? And if it gets approved, then you have two motions on the floor and, and can add another amendment. So you have a basic sure. motion. If you have an amendment, that means that you're making a tweak to the first motion. Yes. And that is then on the floor. If someone decides, you know what? I don't even like the tweak. I don't want that motion. I'm going to make a substitute that third one becomes the motion that we are talking about and it eliminates if, if it if it gets passed and it would only need a, a majority vote then that eliminates the previous two and we work no, backwards from that. that okay it's just a you could you could approve the uh friendly amendment before the substitute motion comes on or can you have a can you have a friendly amendment after the substitute motion comes on to the original mo motion so a substitute would replace an amendment. So hopefully, again, really we don't have. <laughs> but yeah. the substitute motion does not require a second. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Yeah, I'm but, not clear on the relationship between the, you know, how the substitute, uh, how a friendly amendment works in this scenario. Well, hopefully we, we only have a friendly amendment and we don't then and then if there's a, a another amendment that's considered a substitution jared did you have a comment about that no no that's i, I we, we could probably follow up with you on that if i i under i think i understand what you're asking is that if you have the original you know a, a motion there's a substitute motion can someone then um propose uh, an amendment to that original first motion? Is that, do I hear exactly, that? Exactly, because that would have changed the order of the vote last time around. That, and that's my point. If, you, if the substitute, I, if the friendly amendment was the last motion made, then the, then the vote could potentially have been the original motion, not the substitute motion. Right, my assumption would be that the, the mode, because that's not a, it's an amendment to the original motion, that the motions would still be taken in order as, um, as uh, in Rosenberg's um, That's right. rules, where the the last, you know, the second motion would be taken the first, and motion. then then the first yeah. motion with that amendment, if yeah. assuming that the second one was was not um, was voted uh, down. Right. Yeah. Great. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you, um, Michelle. Yes, Need. Do you have your you have your hands up? Hand up. Yes. I, I understood the Rosenberg explanation to be that the motions are taken in the or inverse order they're made. If the third motion is a motion to amend the first motion, then it would be taken first. It would be considered a substitute motion. It could no, be an amendment. It could be uh, it considered, is, and they are in the order. You're right. The they are. inverse order they're made. Yes, that's so right. So if the last, if the third motion after the substitute motion if the third motion is a motion to amend, then it would be considered first because it's the yes. third, third motion. Okay. But but Teresa, if I can just clarify that that motion, that amendment, Michelle, would be an amendment to the substitute motion, no, and not the underlying main motion, right? No, no, it would be an amendment to the first motion. No, it would not. No, if you've got a substitute motion on the floor then any subsequent motions after that affect the substitute motion and not the underlying motion. If okay. you want to amend the underlying motion, which is the first one, then you have to wait. Okay, that's that was not clear in the, um, the staff exhibit that once a substitute motion is on the floor, you're screwed. You can't amend the first one. <laughs> Well, you can that's go correct. down. That's correct. You have to amend the substitute motion. That's to, right. That's you'd correct. Have, you'd have, to, yeah. And if you're not interested, if you'd have to defeat the substitute motion. That's right. In order to amend the original motion. Oh, this is helpful. Oh, God. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. I didn't mean Zito. to jump in, Teresa. No, no, no. Thank you, Councilmember. Uh, I see Jim and I see Harvey. Yep. So just a, a clarification. Yeah, that's my understanding as well. But um, if it's a friendly amendment, it gets absorbed and doesn't get voted on until the main motion gets voted on if it's friendly. Um, 
that's the one thing I understand. But the second thing that, that kind of was discussed very quickly was the um, call to question. And I want to number one is it, it's a it's a prior, it's a proprietary motion which takes uh, precedence of all of the motions but requires two thirds to pass. Is that correct? Yes. Right. Okay. Because last last time and, and I understood we followed the rules and everything, but we did cut off conversation even of the panelists, but that was done because of two thirds motion that passed. It did? I, 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 I'd rather not relive the whole last meeting, but now we do know what the procedure is. <laughs> do you still have a, a comment, Jim? Did you wanna follow up on that or, or should we go to Harvey? I think still Jim following. is frozen. <laughs> I think Jim is frozen. Let's no. go to you. Oh, I'm sorry. There you are. Um, oh, no, no. I just wanted to clarify that it is, it is. Jim, I'm sorry. You are cutting in and out. There, you're back. But... Okay. Sorry. Didn't about hear that. what I. Oh, okay, so so let me see if I move closer. If you have um, to turn your video, it will help you sometimes. There we go. Video off. All right. So so the just, just clarification that um, a a uh, call question is proprietary and takes two thirds to pass. That's right, and it it happens immediately. Right. It's that's why I say proprietary. It also requires a second, right? I would imagine, yes. It does. Yes. Yeah. All right, good. Just, just a clarification. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Thank you. That is helpful. Harvey, yes. Do you still have that, just, Harvey? I'm just seconding uh, what uh, Jim said about friendly amendments are, are up to, whether it's friendly or not, is up to the original proposer. If the original proposer considers it friendly, then they uh, change the original motion immediately. That's what makes it a friendly amendment. Thank you. Okay. I don't see any other hands up of task force members. I do, however, see a member of the public with their hand raised. Um, staff, can you facilitate that comment or question? Hello. Uh, Blair Beekman here. Uh, this is one of my first uh, general plan meetings I've been to. Thank you. Um, I understand. Yeah, thank you. I understand you had a difficult uh, meeting in August, so I won't try to uh, push too hard my own points of view uh, today. Uh, I just had a quick thought. Uh, I'll have public comment later, I assume. I, is this yes. can be a time to ask for public comment about the approval of the August minutes process. Can I can I speak uh, publicly on that? Is that part of Brown Act ideas that uh, the public can speak on the minute approval process? I will leave it to staff to respond to that. Um, since um, you're on right now, I think for um, we can have you speak on it quickly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I'm totally inexperienced and I'm totally thin in knowledge about how to talk about uh, opportunity housing ideas, I think it was called in the minutes uh, last time. I simply wanted to offer that, you know, there's incredibly interesting uh, mixed income ideas of housing that have been developing since 2019, pre COVID 19, that were uh, really growing in really nice terms. And I, I just wanted to remind you of those ideas at this time. And thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and just a reminder for the public, given that that item is not on the agenda, uh, we are not um, discussing that item. Uh, but Larry Ames, I see your hand is up as well. And this is again on the process and the procedures that staff just uh, yes. right, discussed. right, right. 
a quick question. Is it one half of the people present, whether they're all there or not, or one half of the entire board? Some places do it either way and some places do the others. You have 42 people. Does it take 21 to pass? Or if you have 30 people there, does it take only 16 to pass? You need to decide which one. Thank you, Larry. Staff? It's the majority who are present. Mm -hmm. Terrific. All right. Thanks, everyone. We are all updated and reminded, and I appreciate your assistance in helping uh, helping us manage these uh, these meetings. Okay, so we're going to move on to the staff recommendation on vehicle miles traveled. And is that uh, who, who is presenting that item? It's so Wilson. Wilson Tam from the Department of Transportation is going to present that item. Wilson is our department's transportation planning manager, and he's going to take us through this item. Uh, but thank you, everybody, for having us. Thank you, Jess and Teresa. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Wilson Tam uh, from the Department of Transportation. Um, and today, I'm very happy to present on uh, item number eight of the task force scope, which is to evaluate uh, tier two strategies for uh, transportation policies and actions under the general plan. Um, and so, you know, like VMT is a wonky subject and try, I try to be, uh, you know, as simple as possible here. So, so um, you know, VMT or vehicle miles traveled um, is um, a metric that has been uh, evaluated in the general plan for more than a decade ago. Um, and you know, you know uh, when you know the general plan when it when it was originally adopted in two thousand and eleven, it has ambitious goals, um, and it also identifies a list um, of policies and actions that try to uh, move the city towards this uh, ambitious VMT goal. Um, now, it, nine years have passed, um, and we are in a different situation than before in the case that like we have uh, uh, you know gotten a lot of uh, uh, progress over time uh, some of the progresses in, include uh, you know uh, uh, we have um, some state laws uh, that try to uh, advocate for um, statewide uh, greenhouse gas emission reductions um, and we also have um, adopted a very ambitious uh, climate action plan or a climate plan in Climate Smart San Jose back in 2018 that tries to align the city with the 2016 Paris Agreement of trying to achieve the worldwide, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, temperature growth uh, for not more than 1.5 Celsius degree uh, beyond the industrial time. So, so a lot of these uh, state-related and regional efforts have been going on over the last nine years. And therefore, now we are in the second major review of the general plan, nine years from our original adoption. And this is the opportunity for us to visit or revisit uh, the uh, transportation goals and policies and actions in our general plan and, uh, and recommend strategies to align uh, the city's general plan with these uh, regional and, uh, and climate uh, actions that have gone on over the, over the years. And so, uh, part of the task force scope is to ask staff to evaluate um, whether we are ready to move on to tier two of the general plans, transportation policies and actions to support two things, the reduction of VMT, um, as well as achievement of the greenhouse gas reduction goals of the Climate Smart San Jose. Um, you know, the Climate Smart San Jose is a very uh, comprehensive plan that talks about uh, a lot of strategies that can help the city achieve the greenhouse gas emission goals. Um, and there are, from the transportation uh, sector, there are three major groups of strategies. Uh, one is fuel efficiency. We can achieve uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction through um, uh, evolvement of fuel and try to make fuel um, more efficient than before. Secondly, we can achieve greenhouse gas emission reductions through technology, such as electrification of vehicle fleet. However, um, the very strategy that actually can help the city achieve not only the environmental goal, but also other important goals in the city is through sustainable transportation, meaning we need to reduce vehicular footprint in the city. And the reason why this is the most important strategy, even more so, 
than fuel efficiency and technology is that um, not only because transportation sector uh, constitutes roughly 63% of the greenhouse gas emissions today in the city, but it also helps the city achieve um, other goals such as public life. Um, as the city is trying to grow by 40% in the next 20 or 30 years, um, and most of the growth are going to be uh, encapsulated within the focus growth areas in the city, there's, not just, uh, there's just not enough geography to absorb that growth if we continue uh, with the today's transportation behavior in terms of um, people trying to drive to their destinations. And so um, trying to uh, think more uh, 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 comprehensively about like, how to accommodate that growth and also think from the perspective of how can we um, you know, provide the options for people to make their travel so that people see, um, you know, can spend time uh, outside of a car and, and also um, being able to meet their transportation needs. Um, also, from the affordability standpoint, um, as we are aware of, um, you know, transportation and housing, they are the two, uh, they, they, ca they constitute the, the, the highest uh, expenditure of a household's income. Um, and so um, part of this effort is really about like, by reducing the vehicle footprint in the city, um, we would make transportation options more affordable so that people don't see the need to actually have to drive. They can uh, achieve their travel needs through other sustainable modes and also affordable, affordable modes so that it can drive down uh, the, transportation, uh, the transportation costs um, as it relates to uh, the overall household income. So um, what is VMT? And for, for those of you who have been involved in our city's uh, VMT policy adopted in 2018 in terms of requiring uh, private development to use VMT as a CEQA metric, um, you may be familiar with this map. So this map is a calculation of our vehicle miles travel level today. Um, it basically measures how far people drive. So it's basically a, a, a mileage uh, metric. Um, and it measures how far an average person drives in a day. So usually it ranges between five miles a day to 30 miles a day, depending on where you live and work. And so the map that you see here right now is our residential uh, VMT map, meaning um, you know, uh, the green areas stand for uh, residents who live in those areas usually have a pretty low VMT uh, footprint. They drive relatively lower in a day than other residents who live in the yellow, orange, and the red areas. And usually, for, for uh, high BMT areas, usually those are the areas where people don't uh, have much options or other than driving. So even though they know that like they have a lot of congestion problems, but there's nothing that they can, they can do about it because there's a lack of transit options provided to them. So in order for them to meet their destinations, they can only drive. So that's why those areas tend to have a higher BMT areas than the rest of the areas such as downtown where we have a much robust transit system. And I'm happy to go back to that map uh, for more detailed uh, uh, discussion on that. Um, so right now in a general plan, uh, we identified it uh, three tiers of VMT reduction strategies. And uh, those three tiers of strategies are grouped into um, two buckets, meaning like strategies that are within the city's control, we have definitely, we can devise local policies to achieve those strategies. And then another bucket that is more of a regional effort. And the, the city's role in those efforts is to support and advocate for, for that regional uh, strategies. But those strategies are conducted at a more regional level and outside of the city's control. Um, and the way that the general plan identified it, the implementation uh, phasing of these three tiers of strategies is that um, we would start off by implementing tier one strategies um, and also continuing to support at the regional level the tier three strategies. So tier one and tier three strategies have been in effect since 2011. And uh, some basic uh, evaluation done back uh, in 2011 is that by achieving tier one and tier three strategies, the goal is to achieve a total of roughly 30% reduction in BMT. 
um, tier two strategies do not go into effect until the council determines that we are ready to move forward. And this is the reason why we meet today to talk about whether staff uh, 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 recommends to move on from tier one to tier two strategies. And tier two strategies, um, the difference between uh, tier two strategies and tier one strategies are that, um, you know, staff um, evaluated in 2011 that tier two strategies are relatively more difficult to implement than tier one. So the, the, the implementation logic was that uh, staff would start implementing the more easily implementable strategies in tier one. And then as we are ready to move on to the more difficult strategies, uh, then the council will give us the blessing to move on to tier two strategies. And the goal again is to achieve another 10%. And so by a, a completing all tiers one, two and three strategies, the goal is to achieve in aggregate 40% reduction in VMT by 2040. Um, a related metric to vehicle miles traveled um, is another metric that is relatively more easily understandable, um, meaning mode split. Mode split is a measure of um, what kind of modes people travel to meet their needs. And by commute trips, we mean like work trips. And so, um, a secondary or maybe a, a, a supplementary metric that is also identified as a goal in the general plan is our work trip mode split. And you know the figure here kind of shows uh, the trend that we have seen over the years and also the goals that we are trying to accomplish um, to support the VMT reduction. So right now in 2019, according to the analysis, we are at about 80% uh, meaning 80% of the work trips today are made by driving alone. And the rest of the modes include carpooling, shared mobility, taking buses, walking, and biking. So those other four modes constitute roughly 20% of our work trips today. And our goals as identified it today in the general plan is to achieve um, roughly uh, half of the proportion for drive alone, meaning like the goal is to reduce the driving drive alone rate from 80% today to no more than 40% by 2040. So as I mentioned, um, we have started, we have already implemented our tier one strategies and these are the four major strategies identified it as tier one in the general plan. And we have achieved uh, all of them right now. Um, first is reallocating street space from automobile to other modes of transportation. Um, you know, as part of the bike plan 2020, um, DOT has implemented or delivered um, 400 miles of bike lanes in the last 10 years. And a lot of those bike lanes facilities are accomplished through reallocation of street space from automobile to uh, bike lanes. Um, we have also worked with the VTA to deliver a new transit surface plan in 2019. Um, and we have also um, updated our parking uh, policy to uh, incorporate a transportation demand management program and the monitoring framework. Um, the city has also been supporting tier three strategies um, um, at the state and a regional effort such as vehicle taxes, congestion pricing, and a more regional uh, parking policies. Um, and so as part of the task force scope uh, of evaluating uh, wh whether the city is ready to move on to tier two strategies, um, over the last few years, uh, city staff have actually already started exploring the feasibility of these tier two strategies. Um, in the context of unbundling parking, parking minimums, and these are the parking uh, policy reform that is being considered as part of the American City Climate Challenge. Um, and, uh, and also uh, uh, a related word to that is the creation of the transportation demand management uh, ordinance that would speak to um, uh, TDM strategies and TDM monitoring uh, to monitor the performance of uh, uh, private development to achieve uh, the VMT and most split goals. And 
Um, and besides the strategies that are identified in the general plan, um, city staff have also um, been working on other strategies uh, that could also uh, uh, help the city achieve the greenhouse gas reduction goals, uh, such as in 2015, we have adopted our greenhouse gas reduction strategy, which is the city's climate action plan. And that climate action plan is, um, is going to be considered uh, by council for an update uh, in later this year. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the city has adopted the VMT policy for private development in 2018. Uh, we have also adopted our Climate Smart San Jose uh, plan. Um, and these are the strategies uh, that even though they have not been specifically mentioned in a general plan, but these are strategies that the city staff have, um, have explored uh, to further uh, uh, you know, the achievement of the greenhouse gas reduction goals. Um, um, based on some of the recent uh, uh, state support uh, at the more regional level. So um, let me uh, talk about now um, how has the city performed in our in achieving our VMT and most split goals. And this slide talks about um, you know back in 2009 when the general plan was originally adopted, um, our VMT level was. 14.6, right? And, and uh, we have done another analysis last year um, and our VMT has achieved uh, some reduction, uh, roughly 4% reduction. Um, and, and that, even though, uh, you know, like VMT has been reducing, but not to the trend that we envision as part of the, uh, uh, as part of the general plan goals. In fact, by achieving all the tier one strategies, we hope to achieve roughly 10% reduction and we are not there yet. And our goal for 2040 is, is actually 40% reduction. So this speaks to the need uh, for the city to, to, to come up with additional strategies and policies uh, to help the city achieve those goals. And that means what we have done um, are great, but not enough. Um, this slide talks about uh, what is our current most split uh, 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 share as it relates to our general plan goals. Uh, we, uh, you know, about like 12 years ago, um, our drive alone share for commute trips or work trips is roughly 83% drive alone. And, uh, and we have actually seen some reduction in drive alone rate, uh, roughly 3% reduction um, uh, based on the analysis done last year. Um, however, as I mentioned, similar to the VMT trend, our commute mode split trend um, has dropped, but not to the level that we envision as part of the goal. Um, and as, as mentioned again here, um, our most split goals for commute trips are actually no more than 40% drive alone. So based on the information that I presented so far, um, there are four uh, staff recommendations as it relates to tier two actions. Um, and I will go through these recommendation one by one. The first recommendation is, yes, we are ready to move forward with tier two actions. And the reason is because we have already explored the feasibility of those actions. And, uh, and also it's interesting that uh, since uh, we have achieved all the, we have completed all four tier one strategies, but our VMT goals, but our VMT uh, trend and our remote split trends are not dropping to the level that uh, that help you know that that creates a pathway for the city to achieve our general plan goals. So that means we need to um, think about additional uh, uh, strategies and policies and actions to help do that. Um, and so that means basically like besides looking at our tier two strategies, we have to do more than that. So part of this recommendation number one is not only we are ready to move forward with tier two actions, but also we, instead of focusing on the tiering system, we have, we, we, we think it would be great to eliminate the tiers and think more broadly and more holistically and identify additional strategies that can help the city achieve that goals because we are not definitely there yet. And so, um, you know, and, and also uh, pointing to number three here, um, you know, actions uh, that were originally identified in the general plan were faced based on 
the level or the uh, the ease of implementation, like how easy it is to implement those strategies. And the easiest um, strategies are put in bucket tier one, and the more difficult strategies are put in tier two. However, when we did the implementation phasing of the strategies, we do not we did not have the state backing. We did not have the state laws that speak to uh, the need for the entire state to achieve greenhouse gas reduction goals. Um, and we did not definitely have climate smart and 2016 Paris Agreement. And now we have the state backing. We have adopted the climate smart, which talks about um, more um, or, or uh, uh, more progressive or more ambitious greenhouse gas reduction goals. Therefore, um, we should not be constrained uh, by uh, you know, the, the ease of implementation of these strategies. In fact, a lot of these strategies are actually a lot more easier now to implement than what we thought they are back in 2011. So the second staff recommendation is to amend our VMT reduction goals. So the way that the table can be read is that um, the, our current general plan goals are in the gray columns, like 2040 goals. This is our current general plan goals. And then the yellow columns are our VMT goals according to our Climate Smart San Jose, meaning these are the goals that would help the city achieve the, the 2016 Paris Agreement. And you can see there's some dis, uh, inconsistencies or discrepancies between the general plan goals today and the Climate Smart VMT goals in the Climate Smart San Jose plan. So the recommendation number two is about modifying the general plan VMT goals um, by changing from 40% reduction to 45% reduction to align with uh, the various plans. And also, um, we are recommending to introduce an interim year of 2030, which is 10 years from now, um, and a goal uh, to help the city gradually achieve that goals over time. And so we are recommending to align with the Climate Smart San Jose plan to introduce a 2030 goal of about 20% reduction. Staff recommendation number three, kind of similar to the VMT goals, we also see discrepancies between the general plan goals and the Climate Smart goals, which calls for more ambitious and more um, uh, additional uh, uh, you know, strategies to achieve uh, goals that could align with the Paris Agreement. Um, so again, the gray column represents our general plan most split goals today, which is no more than 40% track alone. And our climate smart most split goals call for no more than 25% track alone by 2040, and then an interim year goal uh, of no more than 45% track alone rate by 2030. The staff recommendation number four is to introduce additional actions to implement Climate Smart. And uh, these are the 10 uh, strategies that staff have um, recommended uh, for inclusion in the general plan to support the more ambitious goals, as mentioned in the previous staff recommendations. And uh, some key highlights here is um, the city have started exploring some of these additional strategies, um, such as a citywide transportation plan. Um, we call it um, the access and mobility plan, which um, would be helping the city identify near-term and long-term investment strategies to help the city um, achieve the VMT and most split goals. Um, besides the citywide plan, um, we have also explored, um, you know, or uh, uh, developing uh, area-wide transportation plans, um, such as, uh, you know, uh, another project that I'm managing is the downtown transportation plan, and also um, other area plans to support urban villages, such as East San Jose Urban Village and Lufi Miendo, um, and also uh, uh, West San Jose a Multimodal Transportation Improvement Plan to support the, the the Tri Village, um, West San Jose urban villages, and um, and these other strategies are also uh, uh, you know uh, additional strategies that were not in the general plan, but we have started exploring these concepts, and we think that these these strategies are very critical 
uh, to uh, to help the city achieve the more ambitious uh, climate action. Uh, sorry, more ambitious VMT and mold spirit goals. So this completes the four um, staff recommendations as it relates to the tier two VMT um, strategies and policies and actions in the general plan. And let me pass back to Teresa uh, for discussion and Q&A. Thank you so much, Wilson. Great job. Um, I'd like to go to public comment first, uh, task force, and then come to the task force members. Um, I think that'll, you know, just expedite our conversation. And so I'm going to ask staff to help with uh, managing the public comment first. Let me share my screen. And then just a uh, uh, task force. Then what we'll do is we'll come back and we'll take the four staff recommendations independently and we'll have a conversation, ask any questions and hopefully get a motion on each task on uh, each recommendation independently. Thank you, staff. So staff, will you call on the, um, the members of the public or would you like me to? On the members of the public in a second. And Robert, you're muted. All right, sorry about that. If you're calling on the phone and you need to raise your hand to speak, you can press star nine as well. Um, let me start my share screen. Uh, we have the first speaker, last three digits of the phone number is 140. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I don't understand how the city is going to monitor everyone's driving and how they're going to drive. Uh, mass transit has hit a major snag with COVID. Uh, how are people going to be able to social distance on, you know, on, on buses and light rail? And the light rail has been a disaster. It's been a money sucker for the last 30 some years. It costs so much money. I, I, I think that all these, uh, reasons to make you not drive your car is, is, is really, really evil. Uh, people spend a lot of money to drive cars, spend a lot of money on a tax on the car. And I think the, the mass transit is dead. It's dead. This, this area is too sprawling. If, you, if you're in the downtown area around rush hour, they have a good bus system downtown, but nobody's on it. This is before COVID. Now, forget it, man. People aren't going to be who wants to live in high density housing? I mean, if you guys want to have this plan, everyone who wants this should go move to Madrid, Spain, where I used to live, and they have an incredible mass transit system with high density housing that they've built over centuries. Um, and you know, they've had a, a a culture of mass transit there for for well over a century, and uh, it's not going to work here. It, it, the, the civic design does not fit mass transit. It never has, and it never will. And if you're not using it in the downtown area during rush hour, then who's going to use it in the suburbs? It's not going to work. It's a, it's a folly. It's a boondoggle. It's completely asinine to do, uh, to think of, of what mass transit is going to be to 20 years. You couldn't look what you've done in the last 30. It's been garbage. It's complete Thank garbage. Thank you, sir. Thank you. It doesn't work. Teresa, can you ask people to identify themselves so that we on the panel know who's speaking, please? Great point, great point. So the next uh, speaker is Blair, right, Beekman? Uh, 
Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Thank Great. you. Great. Two minutes. Okay. Um, thank you for this item. It's very informational. Uh, you know, I, I don't know the full depth of this issue, uh, but the ideas of mass transit are very important to me. And and how's how we are deciding our lives, you know, post COVID-19. It's always really important to me to figure out what were our good practices we were doing before COVID-19, and find ways to continue that. And you know, I you know, I thank you for your efforts, uh, what you're talking about here. And um, you know, I was very much into pre-COVID-19, how to get people out of their cars more and into uh, mass transit. That's in question right now. I hope we can all consider just we've learned important, important lessons in our lives based on good mass transit practices. What we do with that at this time, I don't know what's going to be happening next, but uh, you know, it's a good rule of thumb of where we've been with mass transit. And uh, so, so good luck in our work and our efforts. And uh, you know, I, I work with accountability with technology, and that was totally geared toward the ideas of positive sustainability. And so whatever steps we're taking right now, I just hope we can consider, you know, it's based on the ideas of real positive sustainability, genuine positive sustainability, and what that can actually mean. And, uh, and I hope that can help guide our decisions, what we need to do for ourselves at this time. And, uh, Natural gas is a big issue in San Jose that they've been working on, and uh, they've been doing really well with this subject. And uh, that's my uh, other energy saving ideas right now. Uh, local community energy, a really good project. Um, that's about it. Uh, good luck in how we can all move forward together at this time. And uh, just hopefully this will be just another year or two of COVID-19. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, the next speaker is Dave Puschel. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you for your service, all of you. Um, I'm Dave Puschel. I uh, am here to uh, in encourage you to support staff on these recommendations and uh, remind you how important uh, this problem is. I know one speaker sp sp spoke about, um, you know, how expensive uh, certain things are to do, but um, the alternative is really expensive. You've seen we're already experiencing climate change and having hundreds and thousands of homes burned down uh, because we're having mega fires with um, the fact that California has already since the 80s uh, increased two degrees. And I wanna remind you that you know these greenhouse gases are called greenhouse gases because they operate like a greenhouse for the planet where the warming continues. Um, so imagine you're sitting in a car in the par parking lot and we're rolling up the windows as we produce carbon dioxide, okay? We've got a, it, we're already starting to feel the heat is getting warm. We're seeing all these you know, problems already. Uh, so imagine what it's gonna be like um, decades from now. So on a planetary system, it takes decades to reach the equilibrium. So we're already way behind the curve. So I just want to remind you how urgent this is. Um, and uh, you know, there are other benefits as well as the staff reminded you uh, in reducing VMT. But on climate here in San Jose, um, our transportation is more than 60% of seconds, our huh? greenhouse gas production. So uh, if we're gonna get serious about it, we have to uh, reduce our VMT and so please move forward on the uh, tier two. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you. The next speaker is Robin Romer. Thank you and good evening. I'm a transportation activist living in North San Jose. I have four quick comments on the staff report. I also submitted most of this in writing, but to summarize, one, staff recommendation 4B and 4E should make explicit that any transportation plan that the city develops and implements needs to clearly support our overarching goal of reducing VMT. The current recommendation is fairly vague at this point, and although newer plans are going in the right direction, we still have some older area plans whose implementation would increase VMT of, um, instead of decreasing it. Second, 
Historically, low-income neighborhoods have borne an oversized burden of impact from the transportation system. Staff should develop a recommendation that explicitly incorporates equity considerations into the VMT's policy, especially in terms of mitigation measures in the proposed regional VMT bank. Otherwise, it could possibly be that a project increasing traffic in the low-income neighborhood in San Jose could offset these impacts by contributing to a bike project in Cupertino. Three, four decades, some traffic engineers have argued that widening of roads, adding lanes to highways will reduce greenhouse gas emissions. They argue that by easing congestion, new lanes will reduce the amount of fuel that vehicles waste and therefore lead to lower releases of GHG emissions. This has been proven wrong over and over again. We cannot reduce GHG emissions by encouraging people to drive more. As a matter of policy, the city should reject any environmental analysis that suggests GHG emissions could be reduced despite BMT going up. Fourth and lastly, the biggest question is, will the proposed policies actually be enough to achieve our ambitious goals? There seems to be a significant gap between the city's highest soaring aspiration, the currently planned implementation and magnitude of change necessary. It took us 10 years to reduce VMT by 4%. If this were a marathon, one could say it took us a third of the time we have to run just for the very first mile. So my question is, has there been any analysis done that shows that the general plan and these proposed policy changes will bring us close to achieving the proposed VMT and mode share goals? Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Todd Williams, and after him will be Asin and Daye. Hello, the chart that was presented shows little to no change in 10 years. And the bike lanes that we have all over the city seem overall very unsuccessful. Most driving time is spent commuting to and from work while the goal of reducing greenhouse gases is admirable. Your measures to reduce parking spaces, add bike lanes, implement a pedestrian plan and improved transit systems are moot as long as there's not a centralized business district with jobs like other successful transit oriented cities. You might place some minor focus on transportation measures for the Google Village if that comes to fruition. Besides that, all current residents will hold on to their cars as long as they have to commute to varied workplaces. Thank you. Thank you. Asen and Dye, and then Ali Rico. One second, Asen. There we go. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Asen and um, I am here uh, only as a District 3 in Japantown. A resident as well as a frequent transit rider. Um, I want to express my support for the adoption of the tier two VMT goals and hope that the task force will adopt it. Uh, Donald Shoup teaches us that parking works the same way as the baseball field in the 1989 film, uh, Field of Dreams. If you build the parking, the cars will come. Uh, we need to encourage mode shift in our city to reach our climate goals and reduce the number of cars used for trips. I also support the incorporation of equity uh, concerns and analysis and the assessing of the impact of this analysis. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Jason. Ali Rico and then Monica Mallon, Mayon. So, uh, Ali. Hi, uh, my name is Ali. I live in D3 as well. Um, and I am very supportive of the city's goals to get more people out of their cars and onto public transit and alternative modes of transportation. Uh, I use a lot of the bike lanes in the downtown core. Uh, I would like to see more of them. I would like to see more of them protected. So I fully support the city moving to the tier two of this plan. Um, and I also want to say that I think we should be looking at cities like Madrid and Paris for the goals that we set for ourselves. If we want to be a world-class city in a world-class state, then we should be setting extremely high goals for ourselves and we should be pushing hard to meet those goals. Um, so thank you so much for presenting this. I really appreciate the staff time that was put into this and I can't wait to see what the city actually accomplishes. Thank you. Monica? 
Hi, my name is Monica Mellon, and I'm part of Silicon Valley Youth Climate Action. And as the staff report mentioned, 63% of greenhouse gas emissions in San Jose come from the transportation sector. And I really am supportive of moving to tier two. I really think that we need to make non-car modes of transportation um, really a much more viable option for people. Um, I'm really supportive of many of the things in the staff recommendation, such as transit speed improvements and bike and, and pedestrian improvements. But I also think that there should be something specifically about transit operations funding and advocating for transit operations funding in future ballot measures and prioritizing transit operations funding in future ballot measures. Our transit service is already back to where it was in the 80s, and it could get even worse if the cuts that VTA is talking about right now happen. We really need to be working to increase uh, funding so that we can improve service and have our buses and light rail run more frequently and have buses serve more areas. I know that transit operations isn't very cool to most people, but it's really something that would actually make it possible for a lot more people to take transit. Um, I'm also part of a coalition called Voices for Public Transportation that's working on the regional measure and we released a report uh, today that actually shows that increasing transit service actually leads to much higher ridership. If you wanna check that out, you can uh, go to seamlessbayarea.org slash blog and it's the most recent blog post there. So just really wanna encourage you to look at transit operations as a way to increase non-car mode share. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. And finally, Jill Hoff. Um, hello. Good evening. This is Jill Hoff. I live in central San Jose. Um, I would also like to voice my support for having staff embark on tier two strategies to achieve San Jose's transportation goals. Um, very similar to the previous speaker, I believe that San Jose is pursuing progressive goals and I believe this is incredibly important at this time. I also want to caution the task force as they move through this process to perhaps not be too focused on the fact that we're dealing with a pandemic, hard as that might be to do, because I believe that the city is leveraging everything that technology allows in order to manage the pandemic from a pu public health perspective as it relates to mass transit, just like many other transit agencies are doing right now in the Bay Area. I also think San Jose needs to be given the space in order to help solve the regional transportation problem. Uh, we are not likely going to be a city that can support a central business district that has all the jobs that the residents of this city need. And that's why the previous commenters uh, ideas were so important, which is that we are in the midst of solving a regional transportation problem. And that is what we need to give uh, the city the wherewithal to do. And I wholeheartedly support this effort and I am also excited to see what comes out of it. Thank you, Jill. With that, we will close public comment, and um, I'd ask uh, staff Wilson if you can go back to your presentation, and we can go recommendation area by recommendation area. And task force members, with his sharing of the slides, I'm going to rely on the uh, participant list and the hands raised, and in the order that. I see them. So we'll go to staff recommendations one. And uh, if you have a comment on those, please raise your hands. If not, if you could lower your hand until we get to the recommendation area that you would like to speak on, I'd appreciate it. Okay, so first we have is uh, Jim Zito. Okay, thank you very much. I'm not sure which of the four uh, my comments really lend themselves to best, but let me just put this out there. Uh, first of all, I appreciate all the work that staff has done, and I know how hard they work being involved in uh, planning commission and all the other uh, committees. So I, I get I get that, and I appreciate that. However, I think the last six months has really shown us that there's a new normal. Um, I'm very c uh, curious to know what part did the uh, very steep ramp 
that the Bay Area is taking in switching over to electric vehicles. How has that affected your studies? You said you did your studies in 2019. We are the fastest growing area in the country for electric vehicles <clears throat> and at a lower, um, uh, what do they call household income level as well. So that, and also the city is, is um, investing a considerable amount of money in partnering with businesses to put in the charging stations. So I want to understand how your studies were affected by that. Second thing I want to talk about is given the new normal, I have a st strong feeling and, and being on the school board tells me that there are many parents that want to continue to either homeschool or remote school their children. And I believe that schools, public schools especially, in an effort to bring back students to the classroom because of the competition with charters and private schools, they are um, implementing programs for remote learning um, so that they can maintain their ADA, their, their student enrollment. And this is huge when, when students don't have to be transported to and from their schools. And how has this affected the uh, <clears throat> the studies that we've done. And finally, with all the, the ride sharing, the Uber and Lyft and so on, um, I do believe we're in a new normal. And I'm really concerned that we're going with old solutions to uh, problems that we can probably solve with, with um, working with the uh, businesses that are going to promote. And uh, now that they feel more comfortable with it, remote offices, especially, uh, and the other thing is we're competing with ourselves with the fact that we're trying to be the affordable housing capital of the world, yet we're not fixing the jobs housing imbalance. So with all that, I know it's a lot. I'm just curious to know how that has all been implemented in your studying and what of these four recommendations does that affect? That is a quite a question. Maybe I'll start in and ask Wilson if needed to, to fill in, but I do want to be mindful of the task force's time. So again, I'm, I'm Jessica Zank. I'm Deputy Director for the Department of Transportation, working with Wilson. And I think, you know, one of, one of the things that Jim's comments uh, do relate to, which are reflected at a high level in, in the data, is that technology is changing and changing the outcomes. Um, in, in ways that we couldn't necessarily anticipate or couldn't predict totally back in 2011 when the general plan was adopted. So um, we have looked at that, that decline, um, you know, that decline in vehicle miles traveled that Wilson showed from 2009 to roughly the present day. Um, that, that does not take into account uh, changes in fuel economy, changes in fuel technology, and the addition of electric vehicles. That is any uh, vehicle miles traveled, regardless of the type of vehicle. But in concert with that absolute, you know, per capita reduction in vehicle miles traveled, then you add to that the changes in average fuel economy, especially for this area, and you do see that the greenhouse gas emissions um, from the transportation sector have declined by, you know, more on the order of, you know, it was more on the order of 10 to 11%, although I, I don't want to misspeak there. The interesting thing is that while um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions from transportation are declining, they are declining so much less than the other um, types of energy uh, changes that we've seen as we move to cleaner energy sources and we move to more efficient use of energy, that while the um, absolute amount of GHG from transportation is declining, it is growing as a share of San Jose's greenhouse gas profile. Hence, it's you know growing up to that 63%. Um, I think we all have to uh, take a deep breath and understand how remote learning, remote working uh, will play out over time. That is not baked into the data or analysis yet, but it is part of our thinking about the, um, the increased reliance on shared mobility or new technologies that allow us to meet our collective goals. So it's a very good point, Jim. With that, I'll just try to make sure that we have time for other comments and questions. Okay, next up is Harvey Darnell. 
Hi, um, I have a couple questions, and the question is the problem. One of the problems that I see is the fact that we have around 0.8 jobs per employed residence. So, and that has not changed in the decade that we have implemented 2040. So, how are the outside residents transiting San Jose to cities to the north accounted in BMT? Is one question. Um, that's a great question, Harvey. Uh, they are taken into account because that, that data, Wilson, if you want to put the map back up, um, this, this data, we only see San Jose in this map right here, but the data takes into account that people from all over San Jose are frequently leaving San Jose for their jobs. That's part of why some of our high VMT areas are so high VMT, because as the bullets over on the left kind of, you know, explain, you know, people who have to get far to get to the places they need on a daily basis, job being a very important part of those, the farther you have to go, that is what makes up VMT day after day after day. The closer jobs and housing are together, the, um, the smaller VMT many of our employed residents will have on a daily basis. Um, so it's very important. It really helps if we can bring up our, our jobs to employed residents um, balance. Thank you. And I have a, a question of our staff, of the planning staff. Have we changed that needle at all, the jobs per employed resident? I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but um, that not much. Like you, I mean, I think you alluded to that, Harvey. Um, the the yeah, jobs employed resident ratio is relatively, uh, while it's fluctuated a bit since adoption of the general plan, um, it stayed relatively uh, close to, to where we are um, uh, when the plan was adopted. All right, so, so basically what we're, we're talking about is an aspirational um, set of guidelines that we're going to be implementing that could be as, as aspirational as a the uh, jobs per employed resident, and when we originally said it, I think it was 1.3, and we dropped it down to 1.1, I think. Is that, am I correct? When we didn't make the 1.3? That, that's correct, yeah, we, uh, during the last four year review, the um, yeah, okay. task force recommended, yeah, that was, that was dropped down. And certainly, as, as you mentioned, uh, you know, adding land use is, is an important, um, you know, important piece of this, this puzzle as well in terms of reducing the city's overall uh, greenhouse gas um, uh, reduction, you know, emissions, um, as well as lowering VMT. And so, you know, adding and uh, becoming a more balanced uh, community is, is certainly a, a big part of that strategy. And I would support that. And, and I would rec uh, one of the speakers, the community speakers talked about equity among communities and I pointed out when we adopted the 40% VMT that people with wealth would find ways around uh, not uh, getting on uh, 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 public transport and people without wealth would be uh, limited by the, at the time the v, uh, VTA was almost bankrupt. And I, I don't know that we've d we're doing much better today, 10 years later. Well, maybe our next uh, task force member who's teed up here wants to comment on that. Was that your last question or comment? Yeah, yeah it, okay. you know, I, I support, you know, these are aspirational goals and I support them. Oh, so, thank you. you know. Okay, Jesse, Hi, Teresa, you're, just, oh, sorry, yes. Can I, can I respond to uh, Harvey's? Oh, uh, yes, of course. Uh, sorry about that. No, yeah, no, no, because like I, I, I agree with Harvey on, on, on your comment about, um, you know, like this is this is a city policy, right? But transportation is a regional problem, and um, you know, just us San Jose doing ourselves, like doing our job alone, does not actually solve the regional problem. It requires collaborations from the other cities in the region to do the same thing. And now the promising opportunity here is that um, we have state law that requires every city in the state to adopt a VMT policy. Um, and so cities such as, you know, the city of Santa Clara and Palo Alto, who has high jobs housing balance ratios, are required to reduce the VMT level 
uh, from private development. And so when all cities are doing their part, then the goals of achieving the regional uh, jobs and housing balance will be much better, uh, will be much easier um, uh, in the future than, than yesterday. Um, and now we are, in, we are in year three of our VMT policy and some of the other cities are just, have just recently adopted their respective policies. So it may take a few years for the actual uh, uh, jobs housing ratio to get realized, um, but, but we are hopefully in the right trend. Thank you, Wilson. Okay, Jesse, O'Malley Solis. I um, thank you, Wilson and Jessica. Uh, real quickly, Harvey, um, you can log into our monthly board meeting to hear more about our budgets at VTA. Uh, we are doing monthly reporting on that. And um, the whole reason why I work for VTA is to build long-term sustainable income sources for our agency to support both operations and maintenance of our system. Uh, one of the things that a lot of people don't realize, and Monica Malone, one of the speakers, touched on, is there's a whole lot of money for capital projects, but not a lot of money for long-term maintenance and operations of transit systems. And so part of the work I do for our agency is to help build a long-term sustainable revenue source for VTA doing transit-oriented development. Uh, but my real question um, here on this item, uh, Wilson, if you can help me, um, we had a few of our staff members review the letter and we really appreciate all the work that's gone into this. And I'm ultimately gonna reserve my comments for uh, recommendation number four. But in the meantime, I have a question on um, table five. And so my question is, will the city update the transportation, transportation analysis policy 5-1 in the VMT policy so that its thresholds, both residential VMT per capita and employment VMT per job move downward over time towards the new goals stated in table five. Oh, what a, what a good question. Can I do a little bit of context for everybody before Wilson answers the specific question? Which is, yeah, yeah. you know, we've, we've done a, a <laughs> um, we, we have our, our vehicle miles traveled based policies currently outlined in kind of two places, two ways. One of them is the general plan. VMT related goals have been in the general plan since it was first adopted as Wilson walked through. Then in 2013, the state made a change in the law around uh, CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act, and said, instead of measuring environmental quality when it comes to transportation by measuring um, how a traffic signal operates, you should really look at the more regional metric of vehicle miles traveled um, related to that development project. So um, San Jose in 2018 was one of the first cities in, in the state to do that. But as Wilson said, other cities have now had to comply with that as well as of this past summer. So Jesse's question is about how we um, update our development specific policy around CEQA for VMT as a follow on to this general plan review. So that's just the context. Um, and then Wilson can answer, I think, probably even more succinctly, the specific question. Yes, uh, thank you, Jesse, for your question. Um, you know, you know, like, uh, try to be concise here. Um, so the answer is yes. Um, you know, you know, the, you will notice that um, our VMT threshold for private development um, it's not 40%, right? Like it's, I think it's about like 15%, which is the percent that is recommended by state. And, uh, and the reason why we adopt the state recommendation for the 15% below, rather than the 40% below as indicated in our general plan goal, um, is that VMT is not something that can be achieved tomorrow or over time, like it, it has to be incremental. Mm -hmm. Um, and we, it requires strategies to come individually and incrementally over time to paint uh, the, you know, the, the, the uh, signomaly or, or the, the, the face of a city, right? Um, and so, um, 
So the goal here is we will revisit the VMT private development policy um, on, a, on a regular basis. And the, the next potential update is gonna be next year. And every time when we did a review of the policy, the threshold is one of the many categories that we will revisit. And the goal is um, hopefully the baseline will decrease over time so that the 15% below the baseline will also drop over time so that as the both the baseline and the threshold drops incrementally over time, hopefully by 2040, the VMT threshold for public okay. development will align exactly with our general plan goal, which is the 40%. So that's the reasoning behind why we adopted that threshold. And we intend hopefully uh, that this is the trend that we envision will happen. Thank you, Wilson. Um, Great, thank you for Shiloh. Thank you, Teresa. Um, so a uh, question that I have is, and I, I just, first of all, actually, I want to acknowledge that um, staff, I thought you did a great job putting together a presentation and presenting the information in a way that was like, I read it and I comprehended it and it just felt like it was at a level, you know, VMT is something that you can get people to gloss over about. And I, I just felt like you, you guys did a really good job conveying this information in a way that was comprehensible. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge that we had a couple people come on and comment about how, you know, we shouldn't even try to do this. It's hopeless. Um, and I just want to counter that uh, with the fact that, um, you know, we're trying to do one of the most difficult things out there is to change people's behavior from what they have been taught to do their entire life. And that is to, and to aspire to do. We aspire to get a driver's license and purchase a car and drive a car. And we're asking people to reject that and do something different. So it's really hard. And so I'm not surprised to see, and especially given the line of work that I'm in, um, cause I'm right there trying to, trying to champion that behavior change. I'm not surprised to see staff report on kind of the lack of progress we've made towards achieving these goals. And I'm wondering if, if staff can just comment a little bit about what their analysis is on that. Um, and then, and um, I'm probably not gonna comment on the other sections, but I just wanted to put a plug in. Some information came out from staff from me uh, late in the day, and I wanted to encourage people to look at it. Um, SVBC, the Bike Coalition, and the Mineta Transportation Institute just recently partnered together to put out a research paper on, um, we did public opinion research on public attitudes towards transportation. Why do people make the transportation choices that they make? What, you know, what factors into their decisions and what is it that might we might be able to do to change that behavior. We're going to have a forum talking with the professor who did that analysis and that research on Thursday. So I just wanted to, I wanted to encourage everybody to tune in and if they can't tune in to go to our website and read the information because there is just a treasure trove of data that helps us understand why people are behaving the way they behave when it comes to transportation. Last thing that I'll say actually, Jessica, before I'll ask you to answer that question is um, uh, one thing that that data showed is that while people who drive are reluctant to see their ability to drive curbed, um, the one place where they're okay is slowing cars down and slowing speeds down to make the roads more safe, which then can make other transportation modes more competitive. So anyway, I'm, my question to staff is, um, you know, why, why is it that you think we're not progressing as quickly yeah. toward the goals? No, it's a, a great question. And if, if Jared or anybody on the planning uh, staff, Rosalind, want to, to jump in here, please, please do as well. But I, I think the fundamental is, you know, the statistics that we have, uh, comparing 2019 to, to roughly 29, 2009, you know, that's, that's a 10 year period. Um, and that 10 year period represents a very small amount of the places where people go in San Jose relative to the overall built environment, right? And it represents a relatively small set of changes to the transportation system as well, right? You think about it, 95% of San Jose and the greater region were fundamentally 
built out the, um, the way they are today before 2009, right? So when we look at what kind of change can be made within this last 10 year period, we're really talking about um, shifts on the margin of, um, of changes in kind of where people are going to and how they're able to get there. What is hopeful and really important is that every change we make moving forward um, between now and kind of the general plan time horizon, those are all opportunities to invite you know, new people into the city, whether they're working or living in the city in a different fashion and give them a different set of transportation options. So it does really, um, I think, speak to the fact that like these land use decisions, these transportation decisions, they're really sticky, right? They're with us for a long time. And then we live with them and people's you know, behavior can, can change to be sure, but kind of on, on the edges, except for these dramatic leaps that we can make. And we have dramatic leaps ahead of us, right? I know it's COVID, but the BART station just opened, right? We're planning for BART to come into downtown. Caltrain is constructing the electrification pro project and changing the service levels that are planned. So we have these transportation changes and then the density planned within the general plan. Those two in concert have the opportunity to take us from this kind of slow roll to asymptotic changes in certain areas of the city in particular. So that's what I'd offer. I don't know if Rosalind or Jared wanted to jump in on that fundamental question, but it's a good one. Thanks, Shiloh. Good answer. Okay, uh, Bob Levy. Uh, thank you very much. I think this was an excellent presentation and I appreciate the uh, very ambitious goals and, and this uh, conversation because you've touched upon a lot of the issues that I've been interested in. Uh, but I wanted to put the numbers in context a little bit. When we're talking about a 43% decrease by 2040, uh, that's overall number a decrease, percentage decrease. We're expecting 20% additional growth in that same period of time. So we're looking at pretty much a per capita DTM um, T reduction of 50, 60, 65% over uh, that period of time. Is that correct? Yes, yes. So All if right. we look from the absolute value perspective, uh, they should balance out. If we intend, uh, if we envision 40% growth, uh, but then for the, for the per capita basis, another reduction of 40%, so it kind of balances out. Yeah, and so uh, you know we've made very little uh, movement on this so far, and and uh, I really like the idea of having ambitious goals because we have a serious climate crisis, uh, but I don't really see the empirical ev evidence that how we're going to get there, uh, and so I know that we don't have time to do that, but I'd love to know a little bit more about how, you know, how the numbers say that we can actually get there. Well, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I thought that was a question, Bob. Uh, you can you can chime in. I'll continue afterwards. <laughs> Thank you. I was just going to put in a plug. Um, we Wilson mentioned we are doing a citywide access and mobility plan, and the crux of that plan is this question of what do we have to do where to get to our goals, so that we really can have that empirical basis and, and solid understanding. Yeah, and, and has Jim started off the conversation? How this is a totally different world than we had before. Um, just one thought is uh, micro mobility is not the same thing it was before uh, with the battery technology and this, I think the city has been very, uh, you know, advanced thinking and getting all these bike lanes in place so we can take advantage of micro mobility. Uh, but that should be done potentially with uh, transit and sort of following the strategy that a lot of companies have with point to point transit where you have a transit hub it's a collector and it goes to a transit hub where it drops somebody off. And I think that's gonna be great when we have uh, BART here. Um, but I think, you know, doing micro mobility with, with, with transit hubs will make a lot of sense. And hopefully our land use patterns will um, help facilitate that. So. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. All right. Michelle Yesney. Thank you, Teresa. Um, could we go back to the screen we're supposed to be talking about the the uh, first? Yes, thank you. 
Um, this makes perfect sense to me, um, in part from a historical perspective. Uh, in 2011 and prior to there, when we were crafting this general plan and doing the environmental review for it, the decision was made to create a completely new document for San Jose, instead of a lot of pie in the sky policies that nobody ever looked at again, these were gonna be real. And we were gonna check up on them every four years with an annual review to see what worked and what didn't work, what needed to be fixed and what needed to be eliminated. And for, from somebody who, <laughs> started working for San Jose in, I don't know, the dark ages sometime. It's been amazing to watch what a difference this has made. We've gone from level of service, which was basically how well are the intersections working, to trying to make the city better in the long term, and what doesn't work needs to be fixed or replaced. And that's what this is doing. It's very clear the staff has already done the work to determine that we can, um, consolidate the tiers. We don't need to have tiers anymore. And I understand that's what this recommendation is. Um, keep working on everything that was included in the three different tiers, add some new stuff and um, ginger the whole thing up to get it working. Um, we know now a lot of what didn't work. We know a lot of what will work. And that's what the first recommendation is. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And I'm in favor of it. I think we should support it. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Megan Fluke. Hello. Thank you. I want to thank staff. You did a really great job on your presentation tonight. And I'm right there with Michelle. I'm ready to support staff's recommendation. I have two questions, though. Um, my first question is there was a member of the public and a few task force members who've asked this question of, will these policies be enough to reach our goals? So I'd like to ask how much closer will the city be in reaching its greenhouse gas reduction goals if tier one, two, and three goals or, and all of the other climate strategies the city is working towards are met? And I'm just remembering back in, I can't remember if it was 2015 or 2016 during the last general plan review process when there was a presentation I think from staff who said that emissions, despite all of the efforts, emissions were going up and would likely continue to go up despite of all of the city's greenhouse gas reduction strategies that were currently in, a, in effect. So I'm curious, are there tonight or will there ever be any updates for this task force as to how we're doing and or how we will do in reducing our emissions in comparison to the last review process? Yeah, so great, great questions. I think that at a high level, that was part of the work that the Climate Smart San Jose plan did because the the information that, that Wilson presented that came from that effort was really based on how do we get to these goals that were de defined at a, at a worldwide level by the, the Paris Accords. Um, and so that really involved moving a, a whole set of different levers and seeing what could work to get us to those goals. And that's part of bringing it into alignment with these recommendations today. Um, at another level, we also are really going to be um, kicking the tires and improving our understanding um, and our estimates of um, what works and how much it works and what else we need to do through the access and mobility plan that we mentioned that's uh, just gotten underway too. So um, that that's the high level answer for you, Megan. Jessica, what's oh. the timeline on your, um, on that plan? On that plan? So it's just uh, starting this fall. Um, you can go to movesanjose.org if you want more information about that plan. I put it into the chat, but there is no chat as we covered earlier. Um, but, and then uh, the kind of plan development, existing conditions, community engagement will go throughout um, this year, this fiscal year and into early next fiscal year. And on the, um, your question on the, the greenhouse uh, gas emissions in terms of comparison from last uh, time around, I could try to answer that. There, there's a little information on that in the, the um, background or 
report for the four year review. It's a linked on um, the meeting materials page. Um, and then also we, uh, the, the report, the, the most recent greenhouse gas um, emissions inventory uh, is also posted on um, our environmental services department's web um, web page as well. If anyone wants to really dig into the data, but so generally, um, the our emissions actually de uh, decreased from the last inventory we did um, during the the previous four year review by about uh, seventeen percent. Uh, most of that is due to you know cleaner electricity being provided by uh, PG and E, um, and uh, there was some um, decline in, in terms of emissions related to transportation, um, but of course that still represents the, the, it's the largest contributor to our emissions at 63%. Um, per, and, that, and with that, that decrease in emissions from transportation, perhaps that could be um, attributed to, um, you know, electric vehicles, I, but, um, We'd have to kind of dig in uh, to the report, um, but uh, on on the whole, our um, emissions have decreased. Thank you, Jerry. Um, this is Wilson, and I would uh, add that um, as part of the Climate Smart San Jose implementation, uh, there is actual actually a dashboard that monitors the VMT and the most split levels over time. So um, I think there are some related data on our Climate Smart San Jose website. Um, and if you click the dashboard link to it, um, you will see some figures that uh, we have shown here today. Um, and and um, the intent is to uh, monitor those uh, progress over time. Um, um, and other notes uh, to, to, uh, to piggyback, uh, piggyback Jess's comments about our citywide uh, transportation plan, um, you know, I will stay at a very, very high level and click here. Um, we, you know, like BMT and mode splits are our outcomes, right? So we have a lot of data associated with the outcomes, but we don't have enough data associated with how people think and how people perceive, why people, you know, behave a certain way. And so it kind of relates to Shiloh's question about, you know, what do we have data supporting the perspectives of people? Like, do we know what, like, why people behave the way they behave? And what would the city needs to modify and change in order to persuade or to encourage people to utilize these transportation options? And, and uh, some of the work that Shiloh is working uh, on um, is actually a similar efforts uh, being done in our citywide transportation plan and our area-wide transportation plans to answer those questions. And so with the limited um, you know, um, funding opportunities, uh, we are able to prioritize the strategies and investments to the ones that would actually help people move the needle and, and that's that's the effort that we are hopefully uh you know going to uh support uh you know uh yeah the the achievement of the general plan goals thank you wilson these are great questions task force members and and really great responses thank you leslie yeah hi everybody can um I, um, I really want to thank staff for all of your work on what is a highly technical topic and kind of outside of my uh, area of expertise. So I, I really appreciate it. I, I agree um, with, with other task force members that the presentation and the materials were really, really good. And I really only want to uh, talk about one thing. So um, the jobs housing balance was, was mentioned by a couple of task force members. Um, but I think about uh, the topic a little bit differently. So I really am hopeful that somehow we can integrate into the policy um, uh, as, as something that's a little bit more intentional about how we plan for housing and jobs in close proximity. Um, I don't think we'll reach the goals if we don't do that. Um, I think it's a false premise uh, to think that if we add new jobs and we don't add new homes that we're going to reduce BMT, um, especially if we're not thinking about jobs housing fit, meaning that we have um, the uh, appropriate affordability of housing near the jobs that we're creating. Um, so I, you know, I think it's a great hope. Uh, that our other cities are going to build the housing that we need for the new jobs that we're creating. 
Um, and uh, that would be great, but I'm not sure it's realistic. realistic. Um, so I do, um, first of all, I have a hybrid car. I get 180 miles to the gallon. I walk to work two miles uh, each way. And I can do that because my job is close by. Um, so I do think that if we want to reach those, what I, I consider to be great, but very high walking and biking um, uh, goals that we're going to have to make sure that, especially for those that we have enough housing that's near the jobs. Um, I'd also uh, think that it is, uh, it is consistent with some of the other conversations we've had as part of the task force, because things like opportunity housing and can really help us with that by providing more uh, opportunities uh, near existing jobs without uh, needing a lot of new land and new resources. Um, and really lastly, uh, this has really been recognized in the regional housing needs assessment process that we're now going through at the regional level. And uh, they are looking at proximity to jobs as opposed to just transit access and looking at how, um, how to uh, place housing needs and housing goals because they recognize that it meets the VMT goals and acknowledges that we need to reduce commutes and get people out of their cars. So I'm just hopeful that we can, um, I didn't see that in here. It's been mentioned by a couple of people, maybe with a little bit of a different um, perspective, but I think that it, it, uh, we're not gonna get those bike and, and walking goals if, if we're not more intentional. Thank you, yeah. Leslie. Great. Uh, Bonnie Mace. Yeah, I'm wondering if we can support the staff recommendation with the addition of these four elements, which many people have already discussed. One is the introduction of new technologies, you know, electrification and others, which have fundamentally changed uh, a lot. The second is the changing face of work. And the Economist had a great article about this changing face of work and the fact that we're going to have, you know, people working from home much more even after COVID. The third is the jobs have housing imbalance, or however you want to phrase it, which many, many people have talked about in a variety of different ways. And the fourth is equity among communities in terms of, of how VMT is done. So I'm, I'm not going to make a motion per se, but I'm wondering if we can incorporate these four elements into the staff recommendation. And then my question for you is, if VMT is going to replace level of service, how does that affect the outlying districts, which are in terms of infill development? I live in Evergreen, for example, and we have very poor level of services at certain intersections, which has made it difficult to build dense, denser housing there. So how is this um, shift from LOS to VMT going to affect the outlying districts, which are more sparsely developed? Thanks. Great. Um, I think uh, to start with, with Bonnie's question about those four elements, I think those four elements are are very much uh, in line with the directions that we that we need to take, and and certainly could be called out explicitly without any um, any harm. In fact, they, I think they would add. I agree with with Bonnie to to the mix. So from a staff perspective, at least, I think we are are well aligned with that sort of motion or or non motion, but a suggestion. Um, and then the the question. Bonnie, I'm gonna go ahead and, and use your question about the outlying areas and particularly Evergreen as a little bit of a teaser for the upcoming general plan task force meeting where we will, not the next one, but, but coming up soon. We, um, we are gonna talk much more about Evergreen and how uh, vehicle miles traveled and level of service have played out um, in the Evergreen East Hills area development policy and other city development policies over time. Uh, we did think it was too much to try to tackle the overall concept and um, and these recommendations at the same time as then also diving into a specific area. So um, we will kind of be be really diving into that at, at an upcoming meeting. And if you don't mind, I, I think it's too big of a topic to try to answer in a question. Thanks, Jessica. Yeah. Thank you. Eric Schenauer. Yeah, good, ev good evening. Um, you know, my dream city would have no cars and everybody would ride transit, ride bikes and walk. Um, but that's not the real world. And um, 
the decision makers need to establish a balance between uh, environmental protection and job and economic growth and increase um, or improved financial uh, position of the city. And the many of the implementation strategies in tier two uh, and other places, um, m m most of them can be um, absorbed by real estate development, um, but some are problematic. And the one most problematic uh, of all is the parking cap or you know, limiting the amount of parking that development projects can have, especially office development. And you know, the, the capital markets that finance real estate development are not located in San Jose. The money is not in San Jose. And they can put their money in any city and any country in the world. And if there is a city that won't allow them to have adequate parking to accommodate the likely tenants for their buildings, they're not going to invest in that city because not having enough parking is a huge risk. And real estate investment is very risk averse. So um, they will go elsewhere. Uh, furthermore, companies have specific desires and needs for employee parking. And if a city is unwilling to uh, accommodate their desired parking for their employees, they will locate in many other cities in the Bay Area, in the state, and across the country. So the parking cap and the limits on parking, uh, the number needs to be set at the right level so that we can push towards reduction in vehicles, push in reduction vehicle mile traveled, but not kill investment. Because as Harvey Darnell pointed out, we've made zero progress in improving the city's jobs to employed resident ratio. Staff has confirmed that. We're a decade into this general plan. We've made no progress in the jobs to housing ratio. And that was the number one goal of the general plan, the jobs first general plan. So staff needs to be extremely cautious on what specific numbers they set for parking caps and limits on parking, or we will kill development, not get jobs, not get economic development, and not improve the city's budget. Thank you. Th thank you, Eric. Um, we have four more uh, speakers, and we have just for time check purposes, we have 45 minutes. Um, so let's go to Sita. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> thank you, staff. I know nothing about VMT, at least knew nothing. Um, now I feel like I can actually ask a question about it. And so big kudos and thank you for all the information. Um, I want to say that I deeply appreciate the urgency of this and I really, really love living in an aspirational city where we don't say, hey, we're not Madrid or San Francisco and therefore we don't have to worry about this. I, I love that San Jose has stepped up. Um, but I, I've been remembering listening to all the comments, um, something my great grandfather who was a priest used to say, which was that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And so I just want to echo what a few other people have said, including Eric and uh, Leslie, and um, that we have to proceed carefully, um, quickly, but we can't be, you know, hitting ourselves in the foot with the ax um, in, our, in our haste. Um, you've heard me say this before, but I'm really concerned that this whole pandemic has not affected people equally. Some people got to not commute and are doing just fine. And then there are other people who have no choice but to commute and their lives have suddenly become many, many times 
more difficult because they don't have the schools, they don't have the other infrastructure that they had before. Um, and if we suddenly take away their parking spaces as well, um, I'm, I'm worried that uh, it could make life, uh, it could not affect a big chunk of people who already have things going their way and it could make life a lot harder. And so my question is, um, what is the city doing to, to check in on that equity and make sure that the people who are least able to afford and make accommodations are not going to be adversely or disproportionately affected by the policies we put in. Do we have safeguards in place for that? Just say hi to that cute little guy. Am I, um, um, it, it, it's a very it's a very good question. I think we've talked about uh, this. Is Jack? He's waiting for a bedtime story. I'm, I'm just kidding. He's fine. He's had a bedtime story. Um, he's just waiting. Um, and the. Um, the access and mobility plan that we've referred to, I think one of the critical things that um, is apparent to us is that a strong equity lens needs to be a, a first step with that effort. Um, and so to that end, we have um, engaged uh, community-based organization partners who can really help us um, from the beginning all the way through that effort, connect differently with people um, so that we're, we're hearing from more than just the traditional voices and trying to really deeply incorporate that perspective as we look at how we get to our goals citywide. So I'll, I'll be brief, but thank you for the comment. And just a quick, um comment, which is that I agree that we should make sure that parking caps are um, set at appropriate levels, carefully measured, and also um, make sure that the transit really does meet um, the goal, the needs of the community. I, I lived in one of the parts of the map, or I do live, uh, that's called unmitigatable, I think. And so I want to make sure my neighbors are <laughs> taken care of. Thank you. Your land use is unmitigatable, not you, Sunda. <laughs> Don Little. Don. Can you hear me now? Here we go, yes. Yeah, sorry, I had my mute on. Um, good evening, all. Um, brief commentary um, from a, uh, a developer's perspective, um, somewhat echoing what um, Eric uh, spoke to in general. My concern, um, well, my shared view is aspiration good. Uh, the goals that are, are being formed here, um, I support. I live the Bay Area 100% of my life. Um, this is important to me. Um, the thing that I um, would counsel uh, this body and, and the electeds is whether it be about housing, urban village, um, station housing requirements, uh, VMT, and the so and so forth, is there's seems to me unless I'm missing it a conspicuous absence of metrics. There's goals, but there's no really touch point to feasibility or what feasibility might look like over time. Um, and you know, so we have these these housing goals that are forthcoming in in, in town, which I can guarantee you will result in no new housing. Um, there will be no new high-rise housing in San Jose in the foreseeable future. That's the hard cold math. Um, so goals, when they get disconnected from feasibility, become nothing but goals. Um, and that's that's really my, my headline message here. So as we go down this road towards reduction of parking and all these other virtues, which I think all of us embrace, as Eric would say, I would love to see that, but there's, we need to live in the world of balance and reality. It would be, and I don't know exactly how to do it, it would be helpful to me if there was some sort of acknowledgement from staff in the general plan documentation or recommendation that there needs to be a metered or gated or um, you know, checkpoint over time for, for where goals are feasible versus just aspirational. Um, and 
I try to stretch my thinking. Parking, easy example. Our office building high rise designs now have several floors above first floors above grade that are higher than needed devoted to parking reality today that we can convert to office occupancy employment space and retail later when the market adapts and transportation infrastructure arrives but um big bold moves take time um and i'm just concerned uh, to close that um, a lot of the policy thing here is exciting somewhat sim city but there's no uh, there's no organization here or or thought to say how do we how do we test this over time for feasibility so it is more than a dream it becomes a reality thank you thank you don I get that I'm hearing that theme a lot and I'm sure we're hearing out of every policy the city is um, considering how do we how do we measure and how do we meter? Um, Megan, I know you had another quick question and then we have council member at MS and Jeff Buchanan. Thank you. Yeah, I had a second question I meant to ask earlier but wanted to sit with staff's answers to my first question before hopping in. So um, the IPPC told us a few years ago that every sector of society was needed, needed to fundamentally change if we are going to ensure a livable planet for ourselves and our children cutting our emissions in half by 2030. If we don't, the planet is going to change our lives for us. And we've already started to see this um, and already started to see what an unlivable planet looks like and what it feels like. Um, frankly, I don't see these goals as aspirational, but as a baseline. So my second question is what strategies have not made it into tier one, tier two, and tier three? that perhaps belong in a tier four that make us a little more uncomfortable, but help us see a dramatic shift in our ability to achieve our greenhouse gas reduction goals. I will add that it's been established by the state and the city that we cannot reach our climate goals and our VMT goals unless we protect open space and sprawl. Has staff considered adding open space protection as a part of its VMT strategy? Thank you. What a good question. Um, I think that uh, taking a look at how open space could be framed in a VMT reduction strategy is a good idea. I, I don't know that we have explicitly looked at that, although we have certainly um, you know, been involved in many of the, the conversations about where and how San Jose should grow, including into existing open space or not. So that's a great, great point. And I think that um, you know, certainly well before the next general plan task force um, convenes in, in four years, we will have the benefit of the access and mobility plan to really think through those tier four, those additional strategies that we haven't thought of today, but that we will need to think of to get to where we're trying to go. Thank you. Um, after council member Arenas, we have Jeffrey Buchanan and then Mariel Cabrera. Council member? There you are. <laughs> you see me? Yes. I'm so sorry. I, I, um, I'd lost my spot there. Um, okay, so uh, thank you so much for, for the presentation. Really enjoyed it. This is a, a topic that I know my community has been looking forward to um, having more discussion. And I won't um, press too much on the um, the, what we all are looking forward to, which is specifically our East Hills Evergreen um, development policy, because that's ultimately uh, VMT will impact this development policy, but it's not the only thing. It's just one, um, something that factors into the development policy. There's only two areas in San Jose that have development policies. One is uh, the east side slash evergreen, um, and then the other is North San Jose. For for those of you who may not know that, although I think everybody sitting around this corner uh, uh, table probably does. So my question is, when we go to that um, slide that looks really red for most of uh, the areas that are outside of the downtown ish uh, area where it looks nice and green, and I know what red usually means. It means bad bad, bad. 
And so for, for areas like my, like mine in district eight, which is pretty um, difficult to develop one, because it has a develop, uh, development policy that really is uh, actually uh, coming to an uh, um, uh, exhaust in its capacity. But second, because of, of LOS, and if we, my question is, if we had a, a, a map that compared LOS to VMT right next to each other, how does, um, how does VMT fare compared to LOS? And I'm gonna guess that it's not that different because I know that you've showed me um, a map. Um, I, think it, I think it was Rosalind at one point, you and your team had showed us a map, probably Jessica, you were in the room uh, when that happened. And so I know that it doesn't, it hasn't fared very well in terms of that trend, when that transition happens, it hasn't happened just yet. Um, there's many folks who are um, afraid that, that if we convert from LOS to VMT, that means that maybe some of these areas are going to be more, uh, there's gonna be more mitigation. And so then, then there's going to be more development or because it's so green in one area, now the, the focus is to then look at some of these red areas and how do we convert maybe some of those areas into green areas. And I, don't, I know for the purpose of this presentation, that's not, um, that's not where we're going with this. I, and I completely understand it, but just to alleviate some of those concerns that are out there, um, because I know that, um, the light rail is going to um, break ground pretty soon. I'm going to knock on wood when I find something. And uh, it's going to break ground next year, hopefully, um, for uh, uh, utility relocation. And we'll create maybe a, a slighter orangey color around that, uh, the vicinity of that, of that area, but not all of District 8. And so I was hoping that you could help um, maybe at the next meeting, I know it's not part of this, uh, today's presentation, but if you could give us uh, an LOS and VMT for, for our next step, um, and would that be possible for, for I, I don't know if it's our next meeting that we're actually gonna talk about uh, Evergreen East Hills development policy, but, it, but if it is that we would have a map that looks uh, from LOS to VMT conversion, would that be possible? I think, yeah, at a, at a high level, that would be possible. I will say um, the map for level of service won't be as kind of geographically legible, most, you know, and what we can look at this more and definitely explain it in much more depth. But, you know, because level of service is, you know, really just measuring that point there and that point there and that right. point there, it doesn't have the same kind of pattern effect, but we can absolutely you know, kind of map that, talk about what it means and why it means. And I would say that, you know, we can always change the color scheme because I think, you know, in this case, like red, red means far, you know, red right. means far from things, far from your job, farther to get to the grocery store, um, all of those things. It doesn't, doesn't mean bad, although the, the greenhouse gas profile for people driving, you know, is certainly could have a, a slant to it, but red means far. No, well, and I, you know what, I'll admit that because we're further away from the city center and probably where most jobs are, that we are driving a little bit more, hopefully with light rail um, uh, at Eastridge, we'll be able to park and ride or uh, there'll be uh, more uh, service or requests for service, or we'll change the way that we actually work and we'll be more remote. Um, and those things alone will, will help um, alleviate some of that in, in our district. Um, but I still think that there is a concern for my district in terms of what, what is the intent? Um, is, is intent to convert these red areas and it, it could be any color but is the intent to convert some of these areas to green is intent to to make it more um uh easier to mitigate um and then of course then uh, also to develop in these areas um because there's a nexus there when um uh when it's uh when there's uh, more opportunities to mitigate in a certain area then there's more possibilities for development um, because it's less expensive to build out. 
So I, I like for that question to, to, uh, to be answered in terms of what is the intention when we convert from LOS to VMT and what is generally our intent. And I, I understand yeah. that this is, this is not what it is right now, that obviously, um, but if you could make it really, really just crystal, uh, crystal clear um, in that way, um, my community can understand and appreciate um, this movement from LOS to vehicle miles traveled. Yes, absolutely. And we can do that um, next time, but, um, you know, to kind of put some fears to rest, perhaps the, the intent is not, it, it is not easy. It is immitigable. It is not easy to mitigate um, in the, the redder areas. It is very, very hard. And in some cases may not be fully possible. So it does not kind of open any sort of floodgates um, uh, to development in the, the harder to develop in areas. That's great. Excellent. And, and so maybe we can just stick to that red color. That would be great. That, you know, I, I just wanted to um, hammer that, that point um, because I know that there's some, some hesitancy in terms of this conversion uh, from LOS to VMT for some of those who have development policies, but that was the extent of my, of my questions. I also wanted to just um, support some of the uh, comments that have already been made around um, equity and how do we build um, equity into what we're doing at the, at the moment, um, because we know that there's some communities that are more impacted than others, um, especially during COVID and probably for the next year, um, who are more uh, and who have been very reliant on um, public, um, transportation. Um, and so as we um, present uh, some of these recommendations to uh, the committee and then uh, to council, how do we, how are we incorporating equity into the recommendations? Thank you, council member. Jeffrey and then my dear. Yep, uh, I'll be quick. Um, so just a, a question for, well, first a comment and then a question for staff. Um, you know, I appreciate the, 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 the boldness of the plan of trying to get to 20% of one of the biggest mode shifts is going to be to move from uh, move into transit to go from from about five percent now to twenty percent now. Um, I think for a lot of us that are that are trying to support transit here in Santa Clara County, and I think probably a lot of us here on this committee, you know, transit uh, is is at the center of of our development goals as a city. Um, but right now, uh, when we think about uh, transit, uh, for a lot of working families here in the city of San Jose, uh, that often means uh, the bus system and the light rail system and operations and right now VTA is considering uh, service cuts of, of, of somewhere between uh, 90 and 70% of pre COVID levels. Um, you know, to, to Jessica, to your points earlier that oftentimes with transit, we see a kind of uh, a stickiness of, of policy decisions kind of impacting. Yeah, and so I think just wor worries about what we saw in, in, you know, the kind of the 2008 recession and the kind of cuts and what that, what that did to trying to boost our numbers. What, if anything, is staff thinking about uh, in terms of these VMT goals, what uh, perhaps some of the more drastic cuts that have been envisioned potentially with VTA, what does that do to those changes? Um, I know the, the board workshop uh, last week, they're pretty explicit on what happens to private development and the possible threats of the lower service levels. Um, I appreciate that in item number four, we have a strategy H uh, talking about boosting operations, but it's, it's almost kind of a, an emergency thing at this point of how will the city and, and our five board members weigh in to keep that level of service up if we're gonna reach these goals. Do you, how is the staff thinking about this? And uh, um, realize it's not necessarily general plan uh, uh, immediate, but it is kind of gonna impact the, the circumstances of how do we arrive at these goals? Yeah, yeah that's a, a great question. Uh, let's see, for, uh, you know, we try to work uh, very closely with VTA, both, you know, on, on the service that they can provide, uh, particularly the reworking of service, uh, the next network that, ha you know, has been, you know, kind of struggling to get into place because of, of COVID in, in a significant way. And that's what Jay Tyree presented at the board workshop on last Friday. Um, and so I think, you know, to put it very succinctly, there's much more to be said about your question, Jeffrey, but um, is that we're trying to put people, whether those are people in homes or jobs or both in places that are just fundamentally much more easy to serve 
by transit because they're proximate both to transit and to Leslie Corsiglia's point to each other. And that that is, you know, kind of supporting building up the ridership that will, um, you know, be able to, to use the transit services and then also support the system further via fares. I think we're also really interested in kind of further work at the, the regional level to just make sure that um, transit is accessible to people throughout, you know, with those affordable fares and seamless transfers, et cetera. No, I appreciate it. Just right now, getting the city of San Jose to support as much operations funding as possible seems pretty important for this general plan goals and just overall for working families. So appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Okay, and then we have Marielle. And then I just want to remind you all, this meeting is intended to go till 8.30 and we have task force members and staff with kiddos and so I try to, you know, stick to the, the scheduled time. Um, so I'm hoping we can get through some motions relatively quickly. Maria? Great, thanks Teresa, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Sorry, I apologize for not being on Zoom. I'm in a location that doesn't have great internet, uh, doesn't have internet yet and not a great, great perception. So, um, I have uh, just a couple quick comments and then I'd like to make a motion. So thank you to staff for the great presentation. Um, VMT is one of the issues that I actually really pay a lot of attention to on the Planning Commission and um, care a lot about. Um, I am very much in support of the staff recommendations. Um, I'm sure some of you know that over, I want to say over the last few days, maybe last week sometime uh, in uh, New York, uh, an artist rendering uh, went up of a digital clock that uh, shows that we have seven years to address climate change before it, it does irreversible damage to our our, um, our planet, as Megan was kind of alluding to earlier. And I think that this is one step in the right direction um, that takes us towards hopefully having a livable planet in the future. Uh, I do um, think that we need to make these decisions and to that point I'd like to make a motion if, the, if um, this is the appropriate time to um, accept yep. the staff recommendation and forward them to the city council. So you're saying all of the staff recommendations one two three and four? Yes. Yes. Is there a second for that motion? Second. Second. Who was, second. Who was, who was the first person that said second? second. Just you. pick what somebody say your name. How's Megan that? Duke. Thank you Megan. Appreciate Can I add that. a friendly amendment, Teresa? Sure. Will you call on me now? I know Jesse had her oh. hand up. Jesse, you want to talk first? No? Okay. Yes, so, this is discussion, so please, yes. So I'm, I'm going to make a friendly amendment to the motion, which, which I agree with, to add the components that I had before to call them out specifically. One is to um, explore the new technologies and their effect on VMT, et cetera. The changing face of work the um, jobs housing imbalance and equity among communities and i was much taken with the other two ideas which were brought up about open space to look at open space and how this might affect us in the future and the feasibility and metrics issue which both um jeffrey and eric brought up in terms of parking etc so i i bonnie i so do you want to add those two additional items so yes. you're saying that staff would consider all of those, uh, approve the recommendation, plus those six elements that they would consider in Correct. The drafting of, okay. D Correct. Does, um, do Marielle and Megan agree? I do. This is Marielle. I'm comfortable with that. And Megan says yes. Okay, any discussion? I don't see any hands up either. Oh, there we go. Jeffrey, I see yours. Yeah. Just, just one uh, small friendly amendment on the, on the fourth item. Um, in terms of the, the, the staff policy around TDMs, um, you know, oftentimes, uh, it, sometimes in policy development in TDMs, uh, we don't often look at the, uh, you'll look at uh, a development, you'll look at uh, the directly employed workers, but you might not work at the subcontracted workers. In Silicon Valley, we have, you know, something like 50,000, probably more than that, uh, subcontracted workers that work in like building services and uh, work in the kind of jobs that unfortunately you can't really work from home. Um, 
So the, we can assume for some time those jobs are going to continue. Uh, in other cities like the city of Mountain View, recently we've been able to get uh, adjustments to their TDM to be able to include subcontracted workers. You know, for a long time, uh, tech companies, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the buses that you would see wouldn't necessarily be made available to subcontracted workers, the, 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 the food service workers, uh, the folks that are working in security that are working uh, as janitors. Um, so we just ask a friendly amendment that maybe we also include uh, looking at subcontracted workers in future TDM policy in uh, section four. So Mariel and Megan, would you like to add? Uh, sure. Sure. <laughs> um, sure. <laughs> I, I don't I, I guess I'm not really quite clear on um, it, what the the change is. I apologize. Oh, I'm sorry for the reference in in uh, item number four uh, among the items are updating uh, policies around transportation demand management programs. Mm -hmm. And so it would be specifically in you know giving additional direction to staff to look at subcontracted workers within future TDM policies. Yes. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, except okay. the funding amendment. So we have a whole list of, of things for staff to look at now. Okay, so we have uh, Councilmember Arenas and then Susan and then Leslie. I just have a quick question about what, what is in, uh, the introduction of new technology uh, to explore that it, it seems pretty broad. What does that exactly mean? We were talking about electrification, but it's any of the new technologies in terms of automotives. Wilson, do you? Yes. You could probably explain it. Um, yes. Um, so, so in fact, uh, we originally included electrification of vehicles in, in one of the additional policies uh, here in item four. Um, but we revised that language to make it shared mobility options because, you know, you know, electrification is as we mentioned, right, is one of the strategies that can reduce climate uh, uh, greenhouse gas reduction. Um, but from the transportation standpoint, it's actually um, making sure that people are sharing the same fleet um, as much as we can, uh, that matters uh, more. Um, you know, in order for us to drive down the VMT, we, we need to make sure that people utilize the resources so that uh, we don't have, uh, you know, the empty seats in the vehicles. Um, you know, so so it's the sharing of the mobility options uh, that is being recommended here. But electrification is definitely one of the uh, important strategies for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, in terms of automotive vehicles, um, you know, um, I would like to, uh, you know, speak for a data that I heard uh, from MTC from uh, in one of their recent studies in the Pembe area, that you know, like the development of AVs or autonomous vehicles. If they are not shared, they're actually, uh, you know, like if they're not shared, um, they're actually going to increase the BMT over time, uh, because uh, a lot of that kind of similar to the Uber and Lyft model, uh, a lot of the vehicles is about like going to the uh, to the origin and pick the passenger up, and carry the passenger over to the destination. So they they actually, um, you know, you know, uh, travel more than a regular driver does um, if if they are not shared. So. So um, just, electric, uh, just electric vehicles and autonomous vehicles alone are not going to help the city achieve our VMT reduction as much as we would like, unless we think about how to leverage the involvement of those upcoming technology to get the sharing aspects of it uh, uh, complete as much as we can. So Wilson, you understand, I just wanna make sure that it is clear to staff what is being asked and included. Yes, yes. good. Yes. Well, well I, I had a comment there concerning uh, technology as well, and that was the uh, micro mobility and the use of electric bikes, electric scooters, et cetera. I think that's going to could change things tremendously. Great. And I also think food delivery uh, is going to also potentially change things as far as people having to go to the store or those kind of deliveries. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. Susan. Yes, hi. Um, terrific presentation also tonight, and I'm appreciating all the comments uh, that that the members have made. Um, I wonder if staff is also considering um, 
dedicated bus lanes and signal priority um, to increase um, the to make buses faster and more efficient, um, more frequent, without having to buy those million dollar buses um, and and hire more drivers. If you, yeah, that's hire. a great great question. And um, yes, we are considering those, um, including working with VTA on their fast uh, fast transit policy implementation, as well as through some of the area plans that Wilson mentioned. We also do have um, transit signal priority in a number of locations throughout the city of San Jose, but we are also consistently working with VTA to improve them, especially in areas like North San Jose, along the light rail, as well as our east, east west spines, um, like Alum Rock, Santa Clara. Right, yeah, because if buses get more, get faster and more, if they're faster than driving your car and getting stuck in traffic, then more people would want to ride bus. Thanks. Thank you, Susan. Leslie. Uh, so I support the motion as uh, proposed by Bonnie um, and accepted by the motioners. Um, I just wanted to also make sure that as we look at jobs, housing balance, we're looking at jobs, housing fit, because that's, um, that's so important. We can build all kinds of high uh, income housing and create a lot of low income jobs and still have uh, a problem with people having to drive in from Modesto uh, or much farther away to get to their job. So uh, important piece. Thank you. Patricia, Kat Salcedo. Yes. Um... I wanted to ask a question. First, let me say I appreciate staff's presentation as well. I think there have been a lot of really good comments, uh, support the motion uh, on the floor. But I did want to ask a question of staff in reference to uh, Jeff Buchanan's amendment. How do you see, what do you see as the process for looking at subcontractors and the TVM policies? I'd like to have a better understanding because it directly will affect future development. And how, how do you see something like that proceeding and beginning to work that into our TVM programs for development? I think um, as I understood the, the request, it was to really explore and be explicit about including um, all, all people who, who work in a place um, as we proceed with, with any transportation demand management requirements. So I think that um, from a process perspective, uh, we, can actually, we, can, we can certainly take that um, request in and fold it into uh, the TDM, transportation demand management policies moving forward. I don't think that, um, to answer your question very directly, Pat, I don't think that there is a single process, right? Because different developments, they might turn over over time. There's not a, a single way that that would be implemented. Um, but in many of our um, development projects, we do have transportation demand management conditions. And as Wilson mentioned, we're um, looking at how to, to make that, you know, kind of more even across uh, development throughout the city. And we can certainly, as uh, the motion includes at this point, I believe, look at how that would apply to, to people regardless of who they work for within a building. I appreciate that. The other question I wanted to ask was, uh, going back to Jim Zito's first comments, what is staff's, do you have a protocol yet or a process the new normal that we talk about, it's been brought up several times this evening on how you're going to continue post COVID to track what these new normals are and the sustainability of the new modeling for working from home, kids going to school from home, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Let me see, I might start and Wilson, Wilson could give everybody two hours on that question, but I know it's eight, 20. So um, with that in mind, uh, the, the travel demand model that we use is really how we get this information at this point. And that is an estimate of all the places that people kind of throughout the region go on a daily basis and how they get there. That estimate is uh, richly informed by survey data, combination of census data, 
uh, Caltrans household survey data, economic data, demographic data, et cetera. But it, it really helps us uh, paint a picture of uh, you know, simulating really how people get around and by what modes they get around. So it's not so much tracking. Now, I, I will also share that you know, there's a lot more data out there available in this kind of big data world that we're entering to give us a, anonymized snapshots uh, with real-time information about people's travel choices, et cetera. And so we're, you know, we're looking at the, the reliability of that data and how to best use it while respecting people's privacy moving forward. Thank you. Thanks for this comment. Thank you, Jessica. Jesse. I just wanted to add um, a few comments of just thanks and um, really commending staff on your thought leadership and policy work to address SB 743 transitioning from LOS to VMT under CEQA. City staff is now ahead in moving toward refinements and implementation. These general plan vehicle mile traveled recommendations are on point in their trajectory to strengthen the existing policy. And city staff is once again pioneering with their recommendations supporting transit first ideals for the city of San Jose. VTA hopes that the transit first work will become a new high bar and model for our member agencies. VTA encourages staff to continue to look at how the city views transit oriented development and process of streamlining transit oriented development projects citywide in the context of this policy. Further, it's important to review equity implications throughout the implementation process. In May of 2020, VTA released the Santa Clara County, County VMT evaluation tool and VTA looks forward to working together to integrate both data and modeling to have consistent modeling countywide. Staff recommendations complement VTA's goals as not only a transit agency, but as a congestion management agency to reduce both vehicle miles traveled and greenhouse gas emissions. I hope that the task force will fully support the motion that's on the table. Thank you, Jesse. Jim Zito? Yes, thank you. And thank you, Pat, for bringing that back up again, because there is a new normal. And I would like to see if it's not already, and it may be, but just to clarify that um, is part of number four with additional actions that we recommend the pursuit of active partnerships with school districts and businesses um, and maybe provide incentives for things like shuttle bus services, which we see coming out of Evergreen Square, remote office and distance learning, because I think that will cut down considerably on um, traffic and the need for people to spend uh, unnecessary hours on the road. Great. Okay, so I just wanted to restate the motion and make sure I have it accurate accurately. So uh, to approve all of the staff recommendations and incorporate um, how the introduction of new technology, the changing face of work, the jobs housing ratio and fit, equity amongst communities, open space preservation, success metrics, and uh, how looking at subcontracted workers as part of TDM measures, that all of those are considered as part of the analysis as this, um, as this uh, policy, this set of policies is developed. We good, I saw a thumbs up. Okay, all in favor, why don't we do it by, um, why don't we do it on the participant list? I'm sorry, you want us all to raise our hands if we're in favor? Yes, please. Okay. And I can't raise my hand as a host, but my, my physical hand is raised, how's that? And staff, you tell us when you have it all. This is Jason, I raised my hand, I just can't figure it out. <laughs> There's, there are three dots at the bottom of the participants list next to where it says invite and meet me and you click on that and then it shows the raise hand as an option. I don't have those three dots. I don't have the three dots. Anyways, I raised my hand. 
Teresa, you may want oh, to do it, it by voice because some yeah. people don't have the three dot, you know, some people can't access the I, Well, Jason just, just Jason let fine. us know. So <laughs> that's, that's fine. Everyone else. And if please. others, if they could let me, I see other hands raised. Great. Staff, did you get everybody's? Well, there are, there are other task force members. I know. Have that have a, a vote? Is that what you're saying? Not voted. Yes, I know, because I'm going to ask who's against in a moment. So staff, do you have you captured everyone who's for in favor? Um, still hold on a moment, Teresa. There's a long list <laughs> to capture. You could do some screenshots. Yeah, we're working on it. Okay. Hey, Jason, you figured it out. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Staff? I, I have the screenshots. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Everybody, can you? Pull your hands down and I will wait until I see all those down. Awesome. Vince, only one left. I can actually, I can lower, there we go. Thank you, Vince. Um, all of those opposed, can you please raise your hand? I see one. Are there others who are opposed? And if you can't find the raise hand function, please speak up. Okay, I see one no vote. Going once, going twice. Okay, thank you. And any abstentions? If you could raise your hand if you're abstaining. And I don't see any votes. There were people that didn't vote or abstain, task force members. All right. Who has not cast a vote? <laughs> Reveal yourself or. Regardless, do we have enough votes that the motion passed? Oh, yes. Yes. Absolutely, but we could also then, do a roll call if, uh, if the motion passed. Then we're it clearly passed. Okay, staff, are you comfortable with our closing the meeting? And if so, can you just remind us when the next meeting is and what the topic is? Sure. Um, we captured the um, yeah the passing motion votes. Uh, the next meeting will be on October 29th, and it will be on Coyote Valley and capacity shifts. And, and then oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, please. Oh, we just want to remind like when we close out attendees, if you guys can fill out the um, virtual meeting survey. Um, one more quick question, Keelan. Uh, so that'll be in October. Will we have a November meeting to take the Evergreen East Hills policy? I believe those are our last two topics. Yes, we're reserving um, the meeting dates right now. Mm -hmm. And then we celebrate. Yes. Right? <laughs> great. Thank you all so much. Really great conversation tonight. Really appreciate. Oh, Jesus, I see your hand raised. What is that for? A, a yay or a nay? Or an abstention? I don't know, somehow you raised, but I'm, I wasn't going to raise my hand, so. Okay. All right. So I voted yes, just in case. Perfect. Thank you so much for clarifying. Really appreciate it. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. A motion to adjourn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Thanks, Jessica.
Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks, Wilson. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Stay safe. Good night, everybody.